Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 23rd of April and this quick look at the week ahead with me Michael Hewson and what's going to be a very very busy week not only on a macro basis but also on a company earnings basis because we've got an absolute plethora of announcements over the course of the next week or so. In fact, it's been pretty challenging in the context of really, I think, what to leave out as opposed to what to keep in. Um, and, for, and for me, I think it's given, given the fact that this week has been a fairly choppy week and looks likely to um, be the first negative week for European stocks in the last seven. I think it's a good time to sit back and reflect on where equity markets are likely to go to next. I think one of the things um, that's been borne out over, over the course of the past few weeks, and if we look at the German DAX as a very good indicator of that, is how much good news is currently priced in, in terms of the post-pandemic recovery. If we look at this long-term chart, and forgive the lines on that, there's only a couple, but they, they sort of give an indication of an overall direction to travel. But certainly, I think it, we, we can certainly see, apart from a bit of choppiness at the beginning of 2021, um, the, the line of least resistance has been higher. Um, and we've seen seven successive weeks of gains on the DAX. And this week is likely to be the first weekly decline um, in quite some time. Now, there are a number of reasons for that. Obviously, we were overdue a little bit of a pullback. Um, but to hear some people talk, you'd think that the um, um, that Armageddon was coming our way. Ultimately, these sorts of corrections are very healthy. And while um, they could be uncomfortable for long positions, we are still not far away from record highs for the likes of the Euro stocks 50, the stock 600, even US markets as well. US markets have continued to do very, very well. That's, we've seen a little bit of a sell-off. And I think there is a potentially a fear that maybe an awful lot of the good news is already priced in. And I certainly think that there could be a case for that um, when it comes to um, events perhaps um, in Asia, which could impact on the airlines. If you look at the way airline stocks have gone up over the course of the past few weeks, you could argue that they're probably priced a little um, bit too high, um, given the fact that international travel, given what we're seeing take place tragically in India, and to a lesser extent in Japan, where infection rates are also rising, it will mean that international travel is likely to take an awful lot longer to get restarted than, say, for example, more domestic travel. And I think that's why you're seeing a little bit of divergence in terms of how companies like British Airways, IAG, are performing relative to, say, for example, EasyJet or Ryanair, 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 which has a much more domestic focus. And when I say domestic focus, I mean in terms of closer to home. Um, there is also some talk that the US and the UK could open up some form of air travel corridor, given the fact that their vaccination programs are, not, are on a fairly similar track. And some of the data that we're seeing come out of the US and the UK is very, very positive indeed. This week, US weekly jobless claims fell yet again. Now that, that bodes very, very well for April non-farm payrolls in two weeks time. Um, we've seen UK retail sales jump 5.4%. In March, despite the economy being in lockdown, February was revised up to 2.2%. Again, you know, a really solid bounce back. Hasn't completely reversed the 8.2% decline in January for the UK retail sales, but nonetheless, it points to a direction of travel. The big question is, will that recovery be sustained? Well, I suspect that it can be, I think it can be maintained um, over the course of the next two to three months at least. So that should bode well for Q2 GDP growth. Certainly Q1 um, does look as if it's likely to be better um, than expected, certainly in terms of the UK. And in terms of the US, we've got US first quarter GDP, the first iteration of that coming up on 29th of April next week. And 
given the data that we've seen out of the US over the course of the past few weeks, this looks set to be a bumper number for US Q1 GDP. Um, you know, it's, a, it's the first iteration, which means that some of the later data that we've seen in March may not be included in that number, but ultimately we're still expecting an annualized expansion of 6.5%, you know, a, a really big jump from what we saw at the end of last year. And personal consumption is expected to drive that quite significantly with a rise of 10.3%. We've also got US personal spending and US personal income on Friday, 30th of April. And again, here, what we've seen is that um, the expectations for that are likely to be fairly high indeed. Not that you'd know it, um, to look at what the dollar has done um, over the course of the past few days. It's very much on a downward track. And that makes the upcoming Fed rate decision all the more important, um, probably less important in the context of what bond yields are doing, because I certainly think that bond yields, US 10-year yields, have found upward progress slightly more difficult to sustain than was the case, say, for example, a month ago. And I think a large part of this um, softening in US yields is on the basis that I think markets are slowly coming around to the idea that this outcome-based guidance that's now part and parcel of the US central bank's new policy of not reacting to perceptions of a not reacting to perceptions of a direction of travel but waiting until both goals of higher inflation and full employment have been achieved, it's cutting through. And that narrative is likely to, to sustain um, or keep a lid on bond yields, US 10-year yields for the short term. But will it do it in the long term? Will another 1 million payrolls number in April start to um, raise concerns about rising costs higher cost push, higher cost push inflation, because we're certainly seeing evidence of higher costs being passed on down through the supply chain. So it's really just a question of whether or not that translates into to higher, higher yields. I'm digressing ever so slightly. Um, so personal spending and income on the Friday. Now, expected to see a big jump in personal income, not surprisingly, a rise of 20% we're expecting there we saw a 7.1 percent decline in february now the 20 percent rise that we we're expecting to see in march is largely down to stimulus checks hitting the doormats of us consumers in march so that will disappear in april what i'm particularly interested in is the us personal spending component how much of that rise in income translates into additional spending now if you look at us retail sales um, for march they were fairly decent they were fairly decent indeed. Um, but the estimates for personal spending for March are slightly more conservative. Um, we saw a February decline of 1%. Um, economists are predicting a 4.2% rise um, in March. Now, that could be that that could be as a direct result of people not spending it all at once. But ultimately, that money is still there and it's still available to be spent or to go into the stock market or go into cryptocurrencies. I mean, let's not talk about cryptocurrencies this week. They've had a nightmare. Um, and a large part of that could well have been down to that announcement on Thursday night that um, came after European markets had gone home, that Joe Biden was looking to increase the rate of capital gains tax to 39.6% for those Americans earning $1 million a year or more. And that prompted a little bit of a little bit of weakness in um, US stock markets last night. Um, a slight overreaction, I would suggest, and you can see that, you can see that there. But what this tells you is we've been very choppy this week. I mean, obviously, this is Monday, Tuesday down, Wednesday up, Thursday down, and now we look as if we could well go high. You know, capital gains tax rates, when Democrats talk about raising capital gains tax rates, you know, that's all well and good. But, uh, you, know, you know, talking about it, and actually legislating for it are two totally different things. And I think when 
investors and markets are near all-time highs. There's concerns about slowing recovery, a global recovery, because of events that are going on in the Far East, um, Asia, India, Japan, rising infection rates there, lockdowns um, there, then it's not unexpected, given the fact that we've got a whole host of earnings announcements about to hit the tape in the coming weeks, the investors will start to take a little bit of money off the table. So last night's reports of a potential rise in capital gains tax is likely to be an opening salvo in a guerrilla war campaign between Democrats and Republicans on how to pay for the huge fiscal stimulus plan that's only just been unleashed um, as recently as a month ago. So I think talking about tax rates is all well and good, um, but the devil will be in the detail. And we're a long way from a doubling of capital gains tax hikes. Um, and even if we do get them, they won't be anywhere near as high as the numbers that were being touted last night. But you know, never let the never let logic get in the facts get in the way of a nice little um, you know sort of byline in the story. And I think a large part of that was obviously behind the big plunge that we saw in Bitcoin um, over the course of the past um, few days. That started to look a little bit frothy. We saw a big sell off. It's now below fifty thousand dollars. But ultimately, what we do have now is where do we go to from here? Because ultimately, this week's price action has seen a little bit of a pause on the upward momentum that we've seen over the course of the past few days and weeks. But it is just that. It's a pause, nothing more. And, and ultimately, if you're not going to put your money in stocks, where are you going to put it? Given the fact that bond yields are now, now, now appear to have found a little bit of a level. So um, for me, it's important to pay attention to the headlines and the narrative, but don't lose sight of the price action. And the price action ultimately is still by the dip. And that's essentially, you know, my, my, my mindset hasn't changed on that. We are still very much in an uptrend for markets in general. And if we look at where the support levels are on the S&P 500, we can see quite clearly through these series of lows through here, that there's a nice area of support in and around 4,110. It's the low, 4,118 there, 4,120 there. And then you've got this low here, 4,121. Um, and then you've got the low here, 4,123. So the big, big low are between 41.10 and 41.20. So for me, we're still in an uptrend and we still look fairly positive while 4,100 holds. If we drop below 4,100, then we may need to reassess our overall strategy. But at the moment, there's a decent area of support all the way through these series of lows through here. And if you want to basically show that in slightly better detail, we can, we can show it in the form of a four hour chart where you can see the number of times that that level has found a little bit of either resistance or support all the way through there. So 4100 is going to be a very key pivot in the course of the next few days. If we fall below that, then we could well see further declines in US markets more broadly. And this is, this is why looking at charts is so important. It's about identifying a level and then adapting a strategy to fit um, a move either off that level or through that level. So let's look at the FTSE 100. Let's, in that context, let's look at the FTSE 100 because 7,000 was a bit of a level for me last week. We went above it. We weren't ultimately able to sustain a move above it, which is disappointing. Obviously, that's a big down move on Tuesday. We've seen a little bit of a recovery back in the course of the past few days. But for me now, I think the big level is 6,800. As long as we can hold above 6,800 and this trend line here, the 50 day moving average, the current uptrend remains intact. So while this sell off is not particularly welcome, it still remains very much a buy the dip opportunity. You buy into weakness in an uptrend, you sell into strength in a downtrend. It's not rocket science. You're not trying to reinvent the wheel. If we look at the, the, the line through these lows here, you can actually draw a horizontal a par parallel line through the highs as well. So we're in a very nice upward channel in the FTSE 100. Um, so the upward momentum that we saw put, saw us push through 7,000 
is still intact despite the dips that we've seen this week. Okay, so I've talked about um, potential um, hurdles, risks, and what have you um, with respect to what's coming up in the week ahead. There's a Fed rate decision on the 28th. Um, again, I don't think we are going to see too much of a change in tone from Fed Chair Jay Powell. When the Fed last met in March, their biggest concern was trying to balance the optimism of a strong economic rebound against rising expectation that the central bank might start to look at tapering its bond purchase program or start to raise rates well before 2024. Now, the data has moved on since then, and obviously Fed policymakers will have to adapt their messaging to fit the narrative of that bumper payrolls report that the strong ISM numbers that we've seen over the course of the past um, few weeks as well as the strong retail sales numbers, but they are only one or two months of data. And central banks, by and large, in my experience, don't generally tend to react to a single data set or even a multiple day or one month's set of data, no matter how good it is. The Fed will be pleased at how the economy is looking. Um, and with a number, another bumper payrolls report expected um, for April, I think they will be keen to temper any enthusiasm or foster any expectation of a change in stance. So we might see some Fed policymakers alter their dot plots to signal a slightly earlier taper, but it's more than likely the messaging will remain exactly the same with respect to this outcome-based guidance, which I referenced earlier. So for me, the narrative remains the same when it comes to equity markets more broadly. At the moment, the trend continues to be positive despite the sell-off that we've seen this week. And while if we look at the candlestick chart, there's nothing particularly concerning here in terms of a potential reversal, then the bias remains very much towards buying the dip. As we can see from, from the DAX, we didn't stay much below, we, we, did, we didn't even get close to testing 15,000. So at the moment, is very much the trend is your friend. So in terms of looking ahead to company earnings, it's an absolutely huge week for um, company results, both UK and US. We have got BP's first quarter numbers on the 27th of April. We've got Royal Dutch Shell's first quarter numbers on the 29th of April. We've got Lloyd's Banking Group, NatWest Group. We've got Barclays first quarter numbers. We've got AstraZeneca's first quarter numbers. We've got Microsoft's third quarter numbers. We've got Apple. We've got Amazon. We've got Facebook. We've got Tesla. I mean, where do you want me to start? What do you want me to leave out? So what I've done is I've, I've basically gone through um, big oil um, first and foremost and looked at BP share price. And certainly I think the rebound in the oil price has certainly done it enormous amount of favours over the course of the past few weeks. Very much in an upward trend here. Oil prices continue to look fairly robust. And ultimately, after overseeing a, a $5.7 billion annual loss at the end of its last year accounts, um, I think most of the attention now will be on BP's debt levels, overall debt levels, because I think one of, the th one of the targets that CEO Bernard Looney set when looking ahead to 2021 was getting overall debt down to $35 billion and that gearing level down um, as well. Now, we've seen further progress on this front, sale of a 20% stake in the Amman gas block. Um, and in April, it was announced um, that the intention to get the $35 billion the debt levels down to 35 billion pound was expected to come at the end of this quarter, Q1. So we'll get an update on that, whether or not they've hit that target. My biggest concern about the oil majors is how, how slow they are being in terms of trying to adapt their operations to um, a slightly greener business model. Um, and I think this is the thing, they spent billions of dollars over the years on trying to source new fossil fuel um, resources, but they're not spending anywhere near as much in terms of green energy. Yeah, but you know, they're, they're buying 
you know they're buying various small companies um, in terms of um, charging networks for electric vehicles and what have you solar businesses in Spain in the case of BP um, you know they've expired a 1.6 gigawatt portfolio across Spain from RIC Energy but they're spending a very small amount of money to do this so really it's a question for me with BP it's about the dividend obviously um, and it's the same with Royal Dutch Shell dividend but ultimately what we've got here looking at the price action we still very much remain a case of we're in an uptrend we're finding support in and around this 286 area here we can just, where I've drawn that line in there it's acted as a decent area of support all the way through here can it continue to do so or will BP disappoint in its first quarter numbers when it releases them on the 27th um, certainly looking at the looking at the, the the highs here we're starting to run out of steam a bit so my concern is if we do drop below 286 we could see a little bit of a slip lower but overall um, we're enjoying a you know fairly decent recovery when it comes to BP it wouldn't surprise you to know that Royal Dutch Shell is probably fairly similar trading in a little bit of a range so I think in the, in the case of this particular chart it's very easy to um, define your trading boundaries we've got fairly decent support in and around 1225 1227 1230 depending on where you want to put your line and on the upside um, fairly decent selling interest anywhere above 1420 1430 there or thereabouts so um, very much trading in a little bit of a range when it comes to the oil majors banks um, Lloyd's Banking Group it's been one of the serial underperformers when it comes to the UK banking sector now this is where we were just over a year ago so if you look at how people are perceiving the UK economy now and how they were a year ago um, well over a year ago Lloyd's Bank shares are still well below their February peaks their pre-pandemic peaks that for me makes no sense whatsoever none zero um, if we look at Lloyd's Bank if we if we take US banks as a template and obviously you, you, you're comparing apples and oranges because obviously Lloyd's Bank doesn't have an investment banking division but one of the key takeaways that I took from US bank earnings was the fact they're rotating capital back out of um, potential impairments back onto the balance sheet um, ultimately US banks are much more optimistic about not taking as many impairments as they thought they would a year ago and I think the same probably holds true for the UK banks as well um, you know Lloyd set aside 4.2 billion pounds in terms of non-performing loans for 2020 now I would be very surprised if they use all of that so the big question for me then is what happens with that money do they pay out in terms of an extra do they pay out in terms of dividends do they rotate the capital back onto the balance sheet does does the has the recent increase in bond yields actually improve profitability for these banks I mean if you look at the way Lloyd's um, net interest margin has been it's one of the better ones in the UK banking sector so there's no reason to suppose that won't improve either so certainly in terms of first quarter trading I would be very disappointed if those numbers didn't actually put a floor at around about 40p on the share price and send us back up towards the highs that we've seen earlier this month in April and back towards 50p very surprised indeed given the data that we're seeing coming out of the UK economy given the fact that the impairment numbers may not be anywhere near as bad or as budgeted for it's going to be a similar sort of story for NatWest Group as well um, with NatWest there's been probably more outperformance there because of the fact that the valuation on NatWest and say for example um, Barclays has probably been slightly more bombed out but if we look at NatWest Group we've seen a much better outperformance in terms of the share price where it was at the end of September and where it is now we've virtually we've almost doubled the share price but we're still below the levels that we saw in February albeit we've come back an awful lot more and so for example Lloyd's has 
but we can see from this chart here that there's still potential for us to go a little bit higher. We're finding a bit of a barrier just below 200p. That's probably more psychological than anything else. And certainly NatWest have had their fair share of negative headlines over the course of the past few weeks. So that's probably holding it back as well. But if you look at Barclays, which does have an investment banking division, we have recouped all our post-pandemic losses. So certainly I think when it, when it comes to good news, a lot of the good news for Barclays is already in the price, probably less so in Lloyd's. But again, they, they set aside um, quite a bit in terms of non-performing loans as well, 4.8 billion pounds. So again, here, you may find that gets revised higher. You also may find that they could pay out a bigger dividend. So again, here, I think there is potential, potential, nothing more, for a significant you know, beat towards the upside. We'll see. Certainly US banks have outperformed. I see no reason why UK banks can't do the same thing based on that same model. So I'll be paying close attention to bank earnings over the course of the past few days. And then, of course, we've got AstraZeneca, which has been in the news by and large for an awful lot of the right reasons, but also for the wrong reasons. Um, and, you know, whatever, whatever your views on the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, um, certainly their PR has probably um, been less than impressive. But ultimately, they are, they're, they, are, they are supplying a vaccine at cost. Um, they're not making any profit from it. It's not something that they're particularly known for in terms of vaccines. And ultimately, I think the share price has underperformed, say, for example, relative to um, its peers like Pfizer. Nonetheless, if you look at the way the share price has gone, it's one of those share prices that's really, you know, I struggle, I struggle with enthusiasm for it. So I think irrespective of the numbers that we get out on, on on Friday, um, the expectation is that total revenue is going to rise by a low teens percentage. So we're talking about 12 or 13 percent. And one of the things that I think will be particularly notable will be um, how is COVID-19 vaccine costs and such like are included in this quarter's numbers because at the in their four year numbers none of those none of those costs were actually included um, at the end of last year and it's something that AstraZeneca said that they would include in the next set of numbers so it'll be interesting to see what the dynamics are in terms of whether or not there's been a significant impact on revenue and profit from the sale of its COVID-19 vaccine um, in this particular quarter so that more than anything, I think, probably won't dictate the share price too much, but it's ultimately interesting in any case. We've also got Apple and Tesla earnings. So let's go with Tesla, because I think these could, again here, nice little uptrend for Tesla. And if we look at what's expected, last year, Tesla only just missed out on meeting its target of selling 500,000 cars in a single year. Now, obviously it was helped in this by the addition of its Chinese factory. The Q1, the hope is, well, in Q1, the company said it's delivered 185,000 vehicles, with most of them being the Model 3 and the Model Y. Now, the Model X and the Model S saw about 2,000 deliveries in the first quarter, with the hope that production and deliveries can be ramped up further. So looking ahead, Tesla says it's going to be hoping to start production of its new crossover SUV model um, at new plants in Austin and at Brandenburg in Germany. Now, the plant in Brandenburg in Germany apparently is rolled into delays. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not um, Elon Musk revises down his expectations for the number of cars sold this year. It'll also be interesting to see how much the recent slide in Bitcoin has uh, cost the company as well, given the fact that Mr. Musk has said that he's a big supporter of Bitcoin. I think the one thing that I would say about Tesla is that despite the fact that they've made profits in every single quarter 
over the course of the last five or six quarters, the market cap, their market cap is still in excess of the entire automotive sector. So for me, can they, can they sustain this sort of valuation at a time when the likes of General Motors, Ford and Daimler are starting to ramp up their own electric vehicle offerings and have the ability to scale that much quicker? I mean, I think that's the thing for me. You know, Tesla's scale means that they don't have the same production capacity even now as the big automakers. So does that justify the current valuation at the moment? Still in an uptrend. So there's still capacity for us to dip back to the, towards the 200 day moving average. And while we do so, we still remain in that uptrend. And the, if, if the past few years have taught us anything, it's always foolish to bet against Elon Musk. But at some point, his luck is probably going to run out. And the big question is, when will that be? So that's Tesla, still in an uptrend still fairly decent support in and around $700. So keeping an eye on that. And then let's pick out our old favorite, Apple. Um, seen some fairly decent gains over the course of the past few months. Broken a little bit of an uptrend here. Bounced off the 200-day moving average and rebounded back above the 50-day moving average in the process. And they have also announced a whole host of new upgrades in the past week or so. So the launch of a new iPad Pro, an iPad mini, a new iMac, as well as AirTags, which are Bluetooth tracking devices. So in terms of their expectations for Q3, their Q3 coming up, they'll be wanting to really push out these new upgrades and these new products and what have you. And certainly they blew the doors off expectations for Q1 with $111 billion of Q1 revenues um, three months ago, you know, I mean, I was I was absolutely amazed by that. I really was. I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm an Apple I'm, I'm an Apple user. I wouldn't say I'm a fan, but I certainly like their products. Um, and the 5G iPhone continues to be its biggest revenue earner. It, it accounted for about 65 billion, 65.6 billion dollars of the overall revenue that we got in the first quarter. So it's still a big revenue owner. Um, and services are also expected to do well, though, given what we saw with Netflix, and maybe it won't. We'll have to wait and see with respect to that. But certainly, I think the Netflix numbers were a shot across the bows for streaming services, if any were needed, um, when economies unlocked. Very much, very much still in the case of an uptrend for Apple. And ultimately, I think, even with all this talk of capital gains taxes and what have you, um, Apple's valuation still, even if you think it looks frothy, you know, it's a cash rich company. It generates lots of free cash flow um, and has in recent months been acting more like a safe haven uh, than anything else. In the same way that Amazon has also um, attracted a similar sort of flow in terms of the way the NASDAQ has been performing as well. So we've got Amazon first quarter, Facebook first quarter. I wish I could go into more detail. Some of these have got Microsoft. Um, it's an absolute um, plethora of earnings announcements that we've got coming up in the next um, few days. So it's going to be a busy week. Um, a lot of these earnings announcements, expectations, the bar is very, very high. It remains to be seen whether or not those um those um expectations will be valid but overall um expect to see a fairly decent um decent indicator of guidance in terms of how these companies expect to perform over the course of what's likely to be a bumper quarter for personal spending and consumption i'm going to finish off with a quick overview of currencies because at the moment, the dollar is continuing to look a little bit weaker. We've already seen euro dollar push higher, finding decent area of resistance between 12060 and 12070. See where we react here. But even if we do push higher, we've also got this upper line here. So even though the dollar is looking a little bit weak at the moment, bear in mind what the price action is telling you. And while people are talking about euro dollar back at 125, I'm not in that camp, not yet.
not by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I might revise that opinion if we break through here, but for the time being, we're still in that downward channel for euro dollar. So it remains very much a case of sell rallies for euro dollar. In cable, we are starting, we are still, we've still got a fairly solid base in and around 136.70. Now, if we can get through 140.20, then we can revisit the highs of 142. So 140.20 on the upside, 136.70 on the downside. That's the range. Um, but overall, I'm still very much in a case of buy the dip on cable, um, sell the rally on euro dollar, which obviously means sell euro sterling on rallies. And here again, we've got fairly decent resistance at 87.20, 87.30, as well as we've got the 100 day and the 200 day moving average. So keep an eye on those particular levels there, 87.30 on the upside, Euro sterling, um, finding support around about 85.80. But again, um, I'm of the opinion that Euro sterling probably goes lower over the medium term. And um, until such time as we break above 87.30, that's the narrative that I think will play out. So that's pretty much it for this week. I know I've gone on a little bit longer than perhaps I should have done, but thank you once again for listening. Hope you all have a pleasant weekend and I'll speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thanks very much.